morning. Welcome to Operationalizing Ossify. Uh, I'm Nikki Brandt. I lead the product security team at Slack. This is my colleague, Oliver Grubin. He is a senior engineer on our product security foundations team. If you'd like to know what the difference is between those two, ask us afterwards. We love to talk about it. Um, we're here to talk today about a tool that our interns wrote. Uh, as everyone who's ever had an intern work with you knows, interns are wonderful. Uh, they can crank out a lot of work in a short amount of time. They don't have a lot of distractions, unlike the rest of us. Um, and the two interns that we had this summer were definitely not an exception to that rule. They wrote this tool, which Oliver is going to tell you all about, which we've started calling Ossify for Open Source Security Scanner, if I. Um, Oliver was their technical mentor over the summer, so he's going to walk us through the work that they did, and then I'll tell you about what happened after they left. Thanks, Nikki. So as Nikki said, um, we, had, we have an internship program over the summer at Slack. We, it's about three months. Uh, our two interns were Matt Dwanzig and Ryan Slama. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today, but they put together these slides so, for my section. So everything good about the slides, thank them. Everything that I get wrong about it, it's my fault. Um, but they, they did some great work. So we have a problem at Slack. We use a bunch of open source dependencies, probably like everyone who runs an application in this room. Uh, Slack is written on the back end in, was originally in PHP, now is Hacklang, which is kind of a variant of PHP. And on the front end, we use a bunch of JavaScript, uh, React, and a million other things. So unsurprisingly, that means we have a ton of dependencies. Slack's main service has around 3,000 packages once you go down everything. So we on the product security team can clearly not manually assess every one of those and decide if there's a problem, an issue, or something going wrong with that. So, and it's a fast-moving industry, new vulnerabilities are discovered daily, and there's something that comes up all the time. And this is beyond something that we care about as a, oh, we should fix this thing. This is something Slack's customers care about. We have people asking regularly, what is your story for uh, monitoring dependencies? How do you make sure you're not vulnerable? And how do you take care of these things? And this is a high profile thing for those of you that follow the news. You've probably seen things like uh, these vulnerabilities up here where EventStream, which had only 2 million weekly downloads, uh, had some malicious code added to a dependency and downloaded 8 million times just to do some Bitcoin mining. ESLint scope, just with a, a little bit larger, 10.5 million weekly downloads. Uh, that was exfiltrating people's NPM RC files, which contain all of your credentials and will allow people to get into your infrastructure. And these are just the things which are malicious. This is where someone's hacked into a repository and added some code which uh, will do malicious things. This doesn't even count accidental vulnerabilities where people have, where there's an issue or a, a cross-site scripting bug or some sort of error in the dependency which people don't even know about, but which people are still probing and looking for all the time. And in case you wanted some statistics from a totally unbiased source which doesn't have an interest in selling you anything, uh, there's been a huge increase in this sort of problem. So library vulnerabilities have increased 88% in the last two years in general. And 78% of, of vulnerabilities that are found and reported on the internet wind up being independencies for other projects. So it's, it's kind of like the iceberg situation, which we were hearing about in the keynote. You have this little thing of all your application code, which is your high priority because your developers are writing it and you're looking at it. But then you have this huge amount of code underneath, which you don't have a huge amount of visi visibility on which is constantly changing, updating, and being looked at by everyone on the internet. And we really just needed some insight into that. So the goals for this project, we wanted to uh, detect all the code, that all the dependencies that we're using. As I said before, we can't do this by hand. We, we're not a huge product security team. We can't sit there all day checking the versions, looking at the, looking at the internet, checking if anything vulnerabilities is reported, and then doing that every day because these things change. So we needed a way to do this uh, automatically and track the vulnerabilities as they're reported. So we needed to monitor the reports um, and make sure that we could keep track of where we'd reviewed so we didn't need to redo work uh, and can't know where to spend our effort because we also wanted to make sure if there's a vulnerability reported like, that it applies to us because maybe we're not using that section of code. Maybe that's a bit of the dependency that we actually don't care about at all. And we also needed to do some alerting because again, we need to keep track of this in a proactive way. So we wanted a way to let service owners know that there was an issue, as well as a product security team. Because at Slack, we like to empower our developers to keep track of things themselves. We don't want to be out there every day saying, do this, do this, do this. If, if we let people know that this is a problem and there's an easy way to fix it, um, then that's helpful for everyone. So if we could get a good alerting story in place, um, that was really important for us. So 
some of you are probably thinking, why did they try and build this? Like, I build a tool for this, or we use a tool for this, or there are three million tools on the internet for this. And it is something that we considered, um, but we had some requirements which some of the off-the-shelf tools couldn't provide. So, as I mentioned before, Slack's written in Hacklang, which is used by Facebook, it's used by Slack, it's used by some small other companies, but it's not widely used in the industry. So there's not a big market for one of these open source scanning tools to, to check for Hacklang, uh, because there's just not that many companies that would end up using it. So there was nothing out there which had the support that we needed for that. There were some things which could do JavaScript support, but even if we use that, we still need to track the Hacklang and PHP dependencies. We can't just pretend that those don't exist because there isn't a tool for it. We wanted something with robust Slack integration. Probably unsurprisingly at Slack, we use Slack a lot. Um, we have different channels. We have a very defined workflow to, to route issues and alerts and things to different places. And most of the tools, some of them had rudimentary Slack alerts in, in there, but there wasn't, they weren't very customizable and they couldn't do everything that we wanted uh, because we, we know kind of how we want to do this stuff and how we want notifications to go. We kind of, we're a very sophisticated user of Slack. Uh, so as part of that, we wanted the ability to direct alerts for different components to different teams. Uh, when there's 3,000 dependencies, we can't just have them all go into the same three people because they didn't add the dependencies, they don't know about the dependencies, it's not their component of the product that they're working on. So we needed a way to, to mark different things for different people and be able to route them in different ways, as well as also bringing them all into one centralized place for us and the product security team to keep track of these things and follow how things were changing and developing. We also wanted useful tracking for dependencies of dependencies. So of those 3,000 dependencies, we, don't, we didn't manually include them all. Each dependency, especially in the JavaScript ecosystem, has dependencies upon dependencies upon dependencies. And we wanted to be able to know if there was a vulnerability, if it was in a top level thing that we'd included or if it was like three layers down the stack. And some of these tools would just alert that there was an issue with the dependency, but it wouldn't really give you the detail or tell you how uh, you might go and fix it and wh what the dependency path would be. We also have a lot of our code on the self-hosted GitHub Enterprise edition, so there's tools like Dependabot out there, but that only works on public GitHub at this point. Um, GitHub did acquire them, so that support is going to be coming soon. But at the time, we needed something that was going to work with our hosted uh, version, not just on the public GitHub uh, cloud edition. And also, someone here is probably going to say, well, we have a tool that does all this. We, we built it. But we also wanted something with reasonable pricing, because we we are Slack, but we do have a fixed budget. We went public this year. We can't just spend a million dollars on a tool like this. So some of the vendors would say, oh, well, we do all this. We're great. We've got a fantastic tool. And it's going to, because you're a company of Slack size, it's going to be $1.5 million. And like, OK, great, maybe. But that's not something that was within our budget. And it's something that's still not within our budget. So what did we come up with? We, had, we decided to run daily scans for, for, on our code bases to discover the new vulnerabilities and also to resolve whenever we'd fix an issue or upgrade a dependency, um, that we could track that and, and keep that running daily. Uh, we, to do the tracking, we built a dashboard um, to track the status and also the reasons for changes. Um, we wanted to, to give the visibility at a glance at any time uh, what was going on. And we also wanted to add the ability to talk about why a certain alert or report may not be that important and why it could be snoozed or ignored for a certain period of time. And we also uh, built a, a pretty good, robust uh, Slack integration to alert project owners via DM and in channels um, about the issues uh, that came up so that we never miss anything. So I'm not going to do a live demo because we know that's a terrible idea. But here are some screenshots. Uh, so this is from, the, uh, from one of the repos in our GitHub called Highly Secure Dependencies. It's not a real repo. We don't actually have something at Slack that does this. But it has a bunch of issues in it. So as you can see here, we're classifying the vulnerabilities. We're looking them up uh, using an uh, open source system and adding the CVSS score. So here, for example, we have a dependency on Lodash, which is a JavaScript dependency. It has 9.8 out of 10, uh, which is pretty bad, uh, because there was a, a prototype uh, pollution vulnerability, which basically that, that gives you the high level thing. And then you can click in and see more information and see what the problem is. So you can click this CVE here, and it will take you to the open source reporting about it to find more information. And if you click that arrow on the right, uh, you can click in and see, what, uh, see some more detail about this particular dependency. So we have a dependency graph down here. Uh, in bold, that shows you which package we actually included. So that was this comma 6 to 5 preprocessor. And then this complex graph down here shows actually how Lodash, which has a vulnerability, uh, depends on this and what the chain is. So we. As an example for this one, we can't go in and change the version of Lodash that we're including because it's not actually there in our package uh, information file. 
we'd have to upgrade the version of Karma 6 to 5, which would then upgrade 6 to 5 core, which would then upgrade Lodash. And so that kind of helps us uh, understand quickly how complex this resolving this particular issue might be. And this is just an example one. Here we have a, a graph. This is from one of our real uh, repositories. The is URL right there on the right is the vulnerable uh, dependency. And, but gulp image min, image min, PNG quant are the two that we're actually including. So as you can see here, there are, this one is depending on this one, which is depending on this one, which is depending on this one. So each one of these dependencies actually has to upgrade in the open source ecosystem for the vulnerable version of is URL to be fixed. So this shows for us how much this might be an intractable problem because we have to, if this hasn't just been fixed by the developers, we have to track down each one of these and see if it's easy to do, if it's just a PR we can send in to the open source project, or how we're going to be able to address the vulnerability. And for those of you familiar with Slack memes, they also built dark mode. <laughs> so for our Slack notifications, we um, had some priorities for them because, again, at Slack, we know what makes a good notification and what makes a not so good notification. So we wanted to make them actionable. So we want to get the information needed from remediation right in the alert. You don't have to click through and like, read a paragraph of stuff to know what the problem is and whether it's your responsibility or not. We want to make them non-intrusive so that you can snooze them or ignore them because, again, as anyone who's rolled out any sort of alerting tool or scanning tool knows, one of the biggest problems is you just get a ton of alerts. Most of them are false positives or meaningless. You can't do anything about them. And then you just start ignoring all of them. And that was something that we really wanted to avoid here because that just doesn't, um, it's not the way to get these things fixed. If someone's like, oh, it's just another alert that doesn't apply to me, I can ignore it. So we have the ability to snooze these notifications and say, put a reason in and say why it doesn't apply or why it's not important today or we're going to leave it for two weeks. Um, so that ability is in there. And we also wanted to make them configurable so you could, as I said before, route them to the right people, to individuals, to channels, depending on what the project was in. So this is what the notification looks like. Um, this is for an app. So the recent scan found two vulnerabilities. Uh, the high, medium, and low classification, again, is based on the CVSS numbers. Uh, you, it will say what the vulnerability is for the dependency version. And you can click this menu item over there on the right and say, ignore, snooze uh, for a certain amount of time. You hit that, it'll pop up a little dialog box. You can say, snoozing this because we don't actually use this. Or uh, not important right now, assess this vulnerability, doesn't apply to us, or something like that. And then we and the project team will be able to look at those reasons and say, OK, we understand that. We can now assess where we stand with, with some of these uh, vulnerabilities. So that was great. They, they worked on this super hard for three months. They got to this stage, they pushed everything, they have all the code, it's, it's ready to go. But now what? And that's where Nikki's gonna jump in. Yeah, so in my career uh, across many companies, I've seen many intern projects follow a sort of sad pattern, which is that as Oliver said, your interns come, they hit it super hard for three months, they produce a super great tool, and then they go back to their real lives and your team is left to figure out what to do with their tool. And in a lot of cases, what happens is the engineers who are tasked with making the tool keep running kind of just go, eh, don't want to figure this out right now. And the intern's effort is wasted. We got this wonderful tool from Matt and from Ryan, and we wanted to make sure that this didn't happen with their tool. And we realized that if we wanted their tool to not languish, we had to build a process around it that would make sure that it could actually get integrated into our engineering organization's workflow. Um, as security engineers, we're really not experts at designing processes. We're great at finding vulnerabilities, fixing vulnerabilities, building tools, et cetera. But thinking from a process point of view is a little bit of a new opportunity for us. And we use this intern project as a chance to build up the process building muscle. So when we looked at this, the first thing we did is we thought about what questions we needed to answer to make this a useful tool. Matt and Ryan did a great job of setting us up so that we could use this tool basically any way we wanted to. As Oliver showed, we have lots of choices of where we can send the alerts, um, how frequently we can send them, etc. But we need to make some decisions about what's going to happen with this tool. First and foremost, we need to know who needs to see these alerts. Um, should we send these to team channels, show them to all of the developers for a certain repo? Should we pick one point person who gets a DM? Should we send these to the product security team and make it our problem to chase down developers and be like, hey buddy, fix this please? 
Are we expecting people to look at the dashboard regularly outside of Slack? Um, we need to make that decision right away. After we figure out who's going to be the responsible party for the alert, we need to figure out what exactly we're asking them to do with the alert. Spoilers, since we're a security team, we want them to upgrade the package. Um, but as Oliver alluded to, it's not always as easy as just like changing the dependency. So we need to figure out like, in what cases is it okay for a developer to snooze an alert or ignore an alert? Like, who's gonna review what they write into that field for why they ignored it? Is that on us? Um, when we expect people to upgrade, when do we expect them to upgrade by? Uh, how long is it okay for them to snooze for? If we have like a 9.8 vulnerability in Lodash, like we saw in the beginning, like is it okay for that to sit for a month? It's not okay with me. Um, but w would it be okay with a developer? If we don't establish that guideline, we can't expect them to fix it by that time. And then finally, one of the other big questions that we had to answer was how are we gonna communicate our expectations? Um, you know, engineers have a lot going on. If we tell, the, tell someone in a presentation like this today, here's what you're doing, are they gonna remember it next month? What if they don't get these alerts very often? Um, and there are way more questions that we can answer about this over time, but we felt like these were the basics. So once we had those questions, we pulled back and started to think about what a good process looks like to us. Not so much what are the things we want people to do, but like what are the meta qualities that we want the process itself to have. And we talked back and forth about it and ended up on basically these three things that any process needs. It needs to be realistic, it needs to be defined, and it needs to be communicated. Um, go ahead, Oliver. So what do those three things mean in this context? So for us, realism is largely about whether or not we can actually carry the burden of a process. As I mentioned earlier, like our developers are busy. They're doing a ton of feature work all the time. Security is just one of many things they have to think about. If we design a process that's gonna take 25% of an engineer's time, guess what, they're not gonna do it. Uh, and on the other side of that coin, if we develop a process that requires one full-time security engineer to do it, we're gonna drop our end of the bargain. Um, so we need to define a balance in the process between those two things. Um, in terms of defining uh, our process, that's answering those questions that we showed on the slide. Before we release this thing into the wild, we need to know what we're hoping to get out of it. Uh, we did try a brief POC without having set defined expectations, and it was very disappointing for us. Uh, basically, since we didn't tell developers that we wanted them to do a specific thing, they didn't really do very much. Uh, which leads into the third consideration, communicated. It's not enough for us to know what our expectation is. You have to get that out there to the people who you're expecting to take an action. Developers are not mind readers, at least not most of them. So bearing this criteria in mind, we went back to our set of questions and we came up with these answers for it. So our plan for rolling this out is we will have one centralized channel for all of the repos that we're monitoring where all of the alerts will get dumped in there. Um, the primary members of that channel will be members of the product security team. In product security, we already have this on-call rotation where one engineer a week uh, carries a lot of the interrupt heavy tasks for the team. So for instance, they're the person who keeps an eye on bug bounty submissions, they're the person who answers customer questions that week, et cetera. They're already looking at a lot of alerts and being pulled out of work constantly for things, so this is not too much of an ask to have that person keep an eye on this channel. When a new alert comes into the channel, the on-call will look at it and try to find an engineering owner for it. This often is gonna be going to get blame and seeing who added the component. That person will get pulled into the centralized channel and we'll have a canned message that says like, hey buddy, this component seems to belong to you. Here's our expected SLA for upgrading it. That both tells the person what our expectation is and gives them an opportunity to pass the buck. Because um, a lot of times the person who added the component is not gonna be the person who maintains it now. Um, in terms of SLAs, when we expect things to get done, we have a bunch of, uh, different streams for vulnerability identification at Slack, which all follow a particular set of SLAs. So like our Nessus scans, 
our third party pen tests, et cetera. We have a set of SLAs on which those need to be remediated by. Um, in terms of just like not increasing the cognitive load either for our developers or for our team, we're gonna try just using those SLAs for upgrading packages. Um, and those are bucketed basically along the MITRE scores, so high, medium, low. Um, we're also gonna roll this out gradually, starting with one repo, and then hopefully by the end of the year we'll have all our repos covered. That'll give engineering time to get used to the process. And then in six months, we'll take a look and see how this is going and probably make some tweaks. How does this map to our three process goals? Um, we feel like it's pretty realistic because we're sharing the burden between our team and the engineers. Um, we're responsible for figuring out who the owner is and confirming that the vulnerability is something we wanna fix. Uh, we're relying on engineers to actually fix it. It's defined, we have answers to all our basic questions, and we'll communicate it both with a sort of PR round internally where we'll go to channels and say like, hey engineers, we have this new process coming. Um, expect to see it soon, and then we'll reinforce it with those messages in channel where we tell them, here's your SLA, are you the right person to fix this? So, did it work? Um, you might have heard me saying a lot of sort of future tense words in this talk. It's because we have not gotten that far yet with this. Um, we're about to roll this out to our first repo, and in six months I'll be able to tell you how it went. Uh, thanks a lot again to Matt Dwanchik and Ryan Slama. Uh, we wouldn't be here without them. So, yeah. Um, we have a microphone here. What do we, what do you guys do if somebody doesn't meet their SLA? What's your process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, <sighs> without going too far into the details of how we run um, our internal JIRA, we have a PM who is largely responsible for tracking down owners of security tickets and figuring out why they haven't met their deadlines. Uh, is that their full-time job? It's not their full-time job, but it takes up a lot of their time. Um, and we have, engineering-wide, we have a goal to, um, to have a certain threshold of security tickets resolved by their due dates with the expectation that some things are always gonna take longer. Um, I think for things that are on a tight deadline. You know, like, I, I'm more likely to say it's okay to have an extension for a low vulnerability that we don't think is exploitable. Things on a tight deadline will be more active in trying to help engineers resolve those or figure out, um, you know, if we can swap to another dependency. Those are the ones that I'm really worried about, really, uh, both from a security point of view and from a getting them fixed point of view, so. So just a quick question on the impact analysis. You said that the owner of that code who has the dependency is the one who knows enough to, to do that analysis. Where, where do you uh, track and, and persist those decisions so that you're not redoing that each time? Is, is there a place in the tool where, because yeah, I saw the ignore for two weeks, ignore for four, four weeks, how about this is my impact analysis? Is that also tracked in, in the tool? Yeah, so, um in the tool, when you, when you hit that snooze or ignore, you'll get a dialog box and you can say, um, this is what we discovered, this is why it's not important, and that is persisted into the dashboard. So uh, on the screenshot I showed you earlier, when you click into the detail, um, there's like a, a log there of like, on this date, I looked at it, and I did this, and that's why I ignored it, and that stays and is persisted through. Um, an extension here might be to link that into some of our other tracking tools so that there's one place to do this, but so right now it's in the dashboard and we might expand that in the future. I was just wondering to build on that if there's any kind of um, approval process that you have for, or have thought about for securities because sometimes you get those ignores. Somebody says, oh, like, they, they put something in there and then does that mean it's been ignored by everybody and it goes to the bottom of the list but it's, it actually was an important thing. How, ca how can you or how have you dealt with that kind of issue? Is there a security man, like a lead that needs to approve the decision or something like that? There's no approval functionality built into the tool yet, though that would be an interesting um, extension, having it like post and then we have to click to, okay. Um, for when we launch the first one, that again will fall on that PM that we have who refuses security tickets. 
and he'll probably escalate it to me if I had a guess. Which is which is how we manage a lot of our other when we have yeah. other security vulnerability reports like from the bug bounty that would that gets tracked and someone fixes it or says this is not a problem and it's just kind of the workflow we have for tracking these things is that then it kind of the next stage is that someone looks at it and says, okay, we could reproduce it, we couldn't reproduce it, and then we get sign off. So it's gonna kind of tie into that process. I think it's not lost forever. It's not lost forever. Um, it's not I think as we use the tool and roll it out, we might expand some of that stuff so it's all we've got a useful dashboard for all of that, but um, it's still gonna fit in the same process. One note on the dashboard too, um, I know we only showed it briefly. Uh, but most repos, we've of course done test runs on our repos uh, to make sure the tool worked. And unless you have a, like, a lot of out-of-date dependencies in a given repo, uh, you know, you're looking at like maybe three or four per average repo, so you, you'll still see the, um, the ignored one. It shows up just like grayed out on the list. So not gone forever. Someone in. Yeah, so uh, it's good to hear that you've got people that are chasing down these issues, the SLAs, after the fact. I'm just wondering more upfront, you mentioned getting everyone on the same page, expectations, absolutely agree. Just wondering what kind of strategy did you guys use? Um, you know, assuming worst case scenario, you're working with developers who might have an attitude that says, I don't want to do any extra work. You guys are mm -hmm. telling me I have to do more than I'm doing now. And I don't really feel these libraries need to be updated. How did you approach that at the front end? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and this is going to be a, only a partial answer, and I'll let you add anything extra you have. Uh, I think that it comes down a lot to the overall culture of security in your engineering organization. We are very fortunate in that like our CTO is very security savvy. He's very supportive of our org. Um, and we have the ability, if people sass us, to be like, could you maybe talk to these people? Um, and the, the net result is that like we really don't get that much pushback. Uh, where I see it coming up with a tool like this is on those tight SLAs. Um, our turnaround time for high vulnerabilities is seven days, which is like, if you have a complex dependency that a lot of code is relying on, is seven days enough time to upgrade? Uh, that's where I think we're gonna get into spicy water. Um, and that's why we're going to reach out ahead of time and like really make it clear to people, here's why it's important to get this fixed. The public nature of an open source component makes this worse than a vulnerability that we found in like a pen test because other people know about this too. <laughs> um, and I think that's gonna be one of our driving points in getting people to remediate those spicy ones. What do you think, Oliver? Yeah, I think just to add what, to what Nikki was saying, I think we're really fortunate at Slack that the engineers actually care and like it is part of the wider company culture, not just for security, but in general, that people are responsive to issues that, that are raised and like are happy to help. Um, and part of that is company culture. Part of that, I think, is using Slack as a tool because this stuff doesn't just get buried in an email chain. So it's not in your inbox. It's, you can just ignore it. It's like it's in a channel, and you can see the history of how people respond to these things, and it kind of reinforces itself that you see other people responding and being helpful. So you think, oh, okay, if I'm responsible and helpful, like it doesn't get ignored. Because I think one reason developers start ignoring this is they feel that that work's not recognized. That yeah. like they're spending 25% of the time, 50% of the time doing stuff which like a PM at the end of the week says, oh, well, why didn't you do any work this week? But if it's in Slack and you can see a thread of like the security, uh, I got pulled in by the security team and here's what I did, then I think that reinforces the positive behavior where, where people are willing to do the work. Yeah, exactly right. And I think the transparent as aspect helps too. Uh, for people who aren't motivated by like other people doing a good job, they are possibly motivated by the guilt of like everyone can see I've not responded to this post. So that's a thing. I'm sorry, over here. Uh, great project. Uh, interesting to see two interns can get so much done. Um, question, do you guys have any plans to do any call graph analysis to see if the vulnerable function is actually used uh, or like do patching? Um, and it, any plans to open source it? Okay. Um, so I would love if we eventually add call graph analysis um, because one of the things, uh, to go back to his question about getting developers to actually fix vulnerabilities, nothing sells a developer like fixing a vulnerability, like being able to say, for sure this is exploitable in the way that we use this, this component and like here is how an attacker would do this. I personally, like for me, that's much more compelling. I'm going to feel much more like I want to fix something if I know it's really broken. Um, I think most engineers are like that. 
Uh, that said, it's going to be a matter of like team resources. Uh, call graph analysis is not easy. Um, in terms of open sourcing it, I think we've talked about it a little, but the future is hazy on that front. Anything to add, Oliver? Yeah, I mean, just to add on the call graph analysis part, that sounds like a fantastic project. Slack is hiring. Come work for security team, and maybe that's something you can do. Or maybe it's an intern project for 2020 or 2021. Uh, n not to joke, though, I seriously am trying to hire two people right now, so call me. <laughs> don't, don't call me. DM me on Slack. <laughs> um, we're rolling out something similar uh, using a commercial tool, and our starting point is failing on upgradable high vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Have y'all thought about like how a vulnerability that doesn't have an upgrade available might impact the SLA if it's a package that just like, oh, shit, this thing hasn't been updated in two years. Like, probably going to have to find a replacement if we want to get rid of this dependency. Yeah, that's one of the things that um, keeps me up at night about this, uh, especially when you look at a component that has so many dependencies of dependencies. Um, we are going to hit some that don't have an upgrade path. And our initial, I think our initial approach is going to be to try to find replacements, but that's going to be it's going to be messy. Like we're going to have to adjust SLAs on that. There's just no way around it. Discussion. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, at what point in the build process does the developer get notified? I'm kind of curious if you thought about, uh, you know, I think editor versus commit versus uh, a PR time or something like that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, so a. It's a great question. So the initial version of the tool um, would just run daily, so that it would. Um, you could like get regular scans like that. Um, something that we're going to extend it to is put it into our CI pipeline. So every time the package.json file changes or something re related to that changes, we can run an immediate scan um, and uh, do an alert straight away. Because I think, as you're alluding to, if you can get an alert as soon as you change something or update something, that's the most likely time that something's ever going to get fixed. Yeah. And we have a pretty robust CI pipeline uh, tooling at Slack, so it's pretty easy to integrate into that. Yeah, and it would, it would, I think, be roundly great if we could keep people from adding new out-of-date dependencies or new vulnerable dependencies. Do you have a defined software acquisition policy in the teams where they, they look at the project health before they bring it in? As yeah, so um, I mentioned somewhere that we have uh, this triage channel where people come and ask security questions. The official process is if you want to add a new open source component, you're supposed to come to that channel and ask product security to review your library. Uh, we do a cursory review of those, uh, but it's honestly, there is not enough time in the day to do a real in-depth analysis of every package we're asked to look at. So, yeah. My question is more about how this tool works. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, is, is this going to detect issues in this in, in those libraries which you already have modified? <coughs> is it possible? Because most of our tools that, uh, that works, yeah, so they basically uh, mask the checksum of the library itself, and then that will they detect issues. So I'm just wondering, like, if this tool is able to detect issues in modified libraries. Um, so yes, because what for as part of the support for Hacklang, um, we have some libraries which were originally in PHP, which we had to slightly modify so that it would run under the uh, Hacklang runtime. So as part of that, we um, introduced some metadata, which you can do to say this is based on package version X or package version Y. And then we can read that metadata and say, OK, so this is slightly modified, but still package version 3.3 has this issue. It's likely that you might have this issue. So. Uh, and usually the modifications are not going to be around things like that are causing the vulnerabilities. It's going to be, we had to change this code to make it do a thing or to get it to run. So it's it's likely that a vulnerability that's reported is still going to be um, applicable. Uh, it, it does take some more work to run that down if it's a modified version, but we are we are attempting to track that too, yeah. Yeah, that's like one of the coolest parts of their tool. <laughs> I was very impressed by that when they added that. Cool. All right. So there's no more questions. Thank you very much for listening, and come talk to us if you have anything else.